Hey guys, welcome. It is Bible Scribe. Thank you again for joining me, especially on today. It is Resurrection Sunday. It is Easter, and I'm so happy to bring a video to you today. It's a little off the cuff, uh, but we are going to go through one of my absolute, what has become one of my most favorite sections of Scripture, and this is Peter's sermon after Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. I like to call it the most underrated scripture of all time because I rarely hear pastors preaching through this sermon of Peter's in Acts 2. And uh, I actually did hear it from a pastor today. I was surprised by it. Uh, and so I really wanted to just bring this video to you. And I want to go through this sermon with you because it reveals some things about Christ's resurrection and what he did that not many other places in scripture reveal, um, especially about the fulfillment of prophecy and the establishment of his kingdom. And so I'd really like to go through that with you. I hope uh, this is not going to take very long, but if you stick with me, we're just going to go through the scripture. We're going to bring out these points that Peter is making to these Jews in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost. And remember, this is just after Jesus has ascended back to heaven. That happens in chapter one of Acts. And so shortly thereafter uh, is what we're going to be reading about. So let me pull this up. And while I'm doing that, realize too that, uh, you know, in Acts chapter 1, not only does Jesus ascend to heaven and leave the disciples, the apostles, but then the Holy Spirit is sent and it comes upon the disciples. The, uh, and it's the, the, quote, tongues of fire. Well, those are... Actually, in Greek, that's the languages of fire, uh, and it and they the languages rest on them like fire is how it says it, and so they are then able to speak and teach all these Jews who have come to Jerusalem for Pentecost, and they speak and all the Jews hear it in their native tongues from the countries from which they've come, and the disciples, you know, it's it's interesting to think about, but they may not have known what was really happening. They just knew they were supposed to speak the truth. And then these people were hearing it in their own languages. Uh, and it was so amazing. But then, as, as people are starting to hear it, is where we are in Acts chapter 2. Um, also, one other thing, recognize that this is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Uh, Jesus had sat in front of the apostles and the disciples and told them to preach to all the nations, right? Preach to all the nations. And these men in Jerusalem had come from all nations. And Paul confirms this in the book of Romans. If you on your own time want to go and check that out, uh, Paul says the gospel has now been preached to all nations. And that was written after Acts chapter 2 and 1. So, we understand then that this is the fulfillment of a lot of the things that Jesus was talking about with the disciples would happen in the last days, starting with Pentecost. And then this is Peter's sermon right after Pentecost. So that's what we're looking at. So let's get into this just briefly. It's not going to take long, but uh, this is just one of my most favorite passages. It says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one, one accord in one place, and the sound of a mighty wind filled the house. And there appeared to them languages as of fire, and they sat upon each of the apostles. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews of every nation under heaven. And now when, this was, uh, when they heard about this abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because each man heard it and heard them speaking in their own language. And they were all amazed, and it mentions all the different places the people were from, Parthia, Mede, Elam, uh, Cappadocia, Egypt, all these different places, Greece. And then Peter starts preaching in verse 14. That's where I really want to focus from here to the end. It says, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted his voice and said to them, Ye men of Judea, all that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known to you, and hearken my words. These are not drunken, as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. You see that right there in verse 16. And uh, this, 
to me is amazing this section right here what he says about this being what was spoken of by the prophet Joel because a lot of current modern Christian denominations take the prophecies in Joel and they apply them to us now but this is Peter saying no that was the prophet Joel was speaking of this time and he's talking about of course just after Jesus had ascended and the Holy Spirit had come to the apostles. And so it's not something we can apply to ourselves now. I, a lot of modern churches say we are the Joel II army. Well, that's not what Scripture's saying. That's not what Peter himself said. So it, it talks about what Joel had said, that uh, it said in the last days here in verse 17, in the last days, the God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh, and sons and daughters would prophesy, young men would see visions, old men would dream dreams. And he's talking about the time he's in and calling it the last days. Because that's what it was. It was the last days of the, the age of Israel, as we call it, and the start of the new age of the Messiah. And so that's what that last days phrase means. And God was pouring out his spirit on all flesh because of this transition. And how he needed to spread the gospel to start the kingdom of Christ. Okay, and we're going to read more about that as we go through this passage. He says, On my servants and handmaidens I will pour out my spirit. They shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great notable day of the Lord comes. Now this passage right here, those of you who subscribe to my channel, my the video I released yesterday, and this was an update to my timeline of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, it refers specifically to these events in the first century. Uh, there were earthquakes all over the place, there were cities that were destroyed by them, there were probably, if I remember correctly, at least 12 or 13 different earthquakes that I go through in that video. So if you haven't seen that video, go back and watch it. But there are eclipses, more than one. There's many eclipses that happened during that time period. Uh, the moon turning to blood, the moon turning black, two suns in the sky at one time. All those miraculous things happened during this time. And this is what Joel the prophet was talking about. In fact, it's what all the prophets in the Old Testament were telling Israel about this time period in the first century that was going to be so miraculous and special, a fulfillment of prophecy. All the prophecy about the Messiah was this time period. In verse 21, let's go down a little further. Get my icon right there. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. In the notable day of the Lord... And it shall come to pass, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs. Now, note that this tells us... <laughs> getting my tools all messed up here. This tells us that God... The reason Jesus did miracles... And it's told to us right here. He did those miracles to validate who he was in front of the Jews so they would recognize him as the Messiah. And we know from our reading and understanding of the Gospels that they didn't accept him even though there were the signs. And he, uh, he rebuked them for that because he did all these miracles and wonders and it was all to validate that he was who he said he was, which is stated here by Peter but they would not accept it even so. They called him a prophet, they called him you know, a magician, but they wouldn't call him the Messiah, which is what he was. In verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God which you have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him. So they did end up crucifying him and slaying him on the cross. And whom God has raised up Hallelujah. God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death. He defeated death in that Christ was not bound by death, right? He came out of the grave. He came out of Hades, and God raised him up. And it was not possible that he would be holden of it, 
For David speaks concerning him. Now this is the most important part to me of this passage because David was one of the patriarchs that the Jews you know, revered. One of the, the three. It was Abraham, Moses, and David, right? And so this to them was like lightning. Saying David and invoking David into this sermon for Peter to them was like, man, you better listen up. So he speaks about David. He says, For David speaketh concerning him, meaning Christ. David was talking about Christ, he says. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. And that's all in the Psalms. This is a direct quote from Psalms. Therefore did my heart rejoice, my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And that was, cor corruption was a word used throughout the New Testament for, for what happens after death. Um, and, you know, staying in essentially Hades or hell, was that was corruption. And so he's saying, you won't leave my soul in hell, neither will you allow your Holy One, which was Christ, David's talking about, to see corruption. And so this points us to the knowledge that the Jews had before Christ came that there was going to be a Redeemer. And in fact, a lot of the writings I've read say that, you know, from Adam forward, they all knew that God had prophesied and predicted and said he would fulfill this, that he would send a Redeemer to collect the... the dead righteous out of Hades and take them to heaven. That was what this re resurrection was all about. And, and of course, Jesus was the catalyst, right? Jesus was that redeemer, and he was not going to see corruption. He was going to come out of Hades, and this was prophesied by David, just as it was by Moses and Noah and Adam, all the way back. It's just our Bible doesn't give us a ton of information about that, but it hints at it. And then when you open up other writings that were contemporary to the Bible and the scriptures, you start to see that over and over again, that the Jews knew about that this Messiah was going to rescue the righteous out of Hades. And that's the defeat of death that does not any longer bind those people. The righteous are not bound in hell or Hades. Verse 28, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. This is still David talking straight out of the Psalms. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And so now it's back to Peter. That's the end of the quote about David from Psalms. Now this is Peter talking. Men and brethren, let me freely speak to you about the patriarch David. Again, this is lightning for these Jews to hear this. He is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher, sepulcher is with us to this day. So David, he's saying, is dead and buried. He was a prophet, knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, the fruit of his loins, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He's saying this is what God promised the whole time. He would raise up Christ to sit on David's throne. Okay? He's talking about the throne of David. This is what the Jews have talked about for centuries. And this is what Christians talk about today, but they, they misconstrue the throne of David as something that is sitting in Jerusalem. Because listen to what he talks about next. Listen to this. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. He's talking about David. He's saying David was speaking of Christ's resurrection, that his soul was not left in Hades. And that's the Greek word under the word hell. Neither did his flesh see corruption. He didn't stay down there. He was raised. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, we having, and having received the Father of promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. He's saying, first off, he's saying that, that Jesus is by the right hand of God. And he's talking present to when he's speaking, is, and that's right after his ascension. He's saying Jesus is now on that throne at the right hand of God. He's saying right now. And this was 2,000 years ago. So we can know right now, 2,000 years later, Jesus is on that throne, sitting next to God in heaven. 
And that's where his kingdom was established. It says in the Gospels, my kingdom, Jesus says, is not of this world. And it's not visible. And he's in heaven reigning. His kingdom is there. And we are going to be a part of that someday. Man, I just, I love this, this passage. And it says uh, th- that that's why, because Jesus is at the right hand of God, now the Father gives the Holy Ghost to them. The, the Holy Spirit now is a part of them. It was obviously there at Pentecost with the way it landed on the apostles, and they spoke in these different languages. And he has shed forth this, which is what he's talking about, the events of the day, which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens. David wasn't ascended, but he saith himself, The Lord said to my Lord, now this is Christ. He says, sit thou at my right hand. So this is Peter helping these Jew, Jewish men from all these nations around understand that Christ was the fulfillment of everything that had been prophesied. That he was now on the throne of David, which had been prophesied for a thousand years beforehand. Um, and so it's just amazing to me. He's trying to make this case. And it's funny to me, too, that modern Christians... We don't listen to Peter. We don't listen to this sermon by Peter who's trying to plead with us to understand that Jesus is on the throne. There's not some coming uh, kingdom that's going to be established. It was established. Everything that David was expectant for, everything that Abraham and Moses were talking about with the Jews, the whole reason that the law existed was to foreshadow Christ's coming and his kingdom, the Messiah, it was all happening at that time, and it's done. It's fulfilled and completed. It says in verse 35, Until I make thy foes thy footstool, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now just, you know, those words mean something. The word Lord to us in English means king, and the word Christ means sacrifice. It it has to do with that word sacrifice. So this means he's our king, and he was our sacrifice, our atonement for our sin. And and so this is such a beautiful passage. It tells us so much about who God is and what Christ did, all at the same time. That's why I love it so much. And it says, When they heard this, these Jews that were in Jerusalem, they were pricked to their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men, what shall we do? Peter says to them, This is the message of the gospel. This is the message we should teach other people too. And that is, Peter says to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And this is what our churches do now and what they should do. And it says, You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And this happened all through the first century. After people would repent and be baptized, they would receive the power of the Holy Spirit and then uh, would uh, perform miracles. And this is recorded not only in the Bible, but in all sorts of early Christian writings. For instance, Polycarp is one I like. Uh, It's amazing what happens with Polycarp in the second century. And, uh, but these kinds of things, healings, protection from persecution, um, you know, the, uh, like Lazarus raising from the dead, things like this all throughout the first century were recorded, mostly healings and demon, uh, demons being cast out. But uh, in fact, there's stuff I've done in an, another video of mine on Simon Magus. He was an evil sorcerer, if you know much about him. In Acts 2 he's mentioned, but there's a lot of early Christian writings about what he did. But he actually sought out the apostles because of the power of the Holy Spirit, and he wanted that power for himself. So he um, falsely took the name of Christ and professed Christ, but it was false because he wanted the power of the Holy Spirit. He saw people being healed and demons being cast out and controlled, and he wanted that power because he was a magician. And so it's just interesting. This power of the Holy Ghost that was manifesting in the Christians in the first century from this time when Christ ascended through up until about A.D. 70 uh, was amazing and it was attested to that this was a real power that, that God was giving and manifesting through them for the building of the church at that time. Just absolutely amazing.
It says, For this is the, the promise is unto you and your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall, shall call. And with many other words did Peter testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. This was the evil generation that was coming in the last days that Christ talked about and that they preached about. And so they had to be ready. Peter was telling them, separate yourselves from that. These are the people, and you, even yourselves, crucified Christ, so now separate yourself from that and follow him because he is sitting at the right hand of the Father on the throne. Uh, and it says in verse 41 here, then, that, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. They were baptized, and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. So it's just amazing to me this is what you know peter so plainly lays out for these jews and for us what happened at that time period and what jesus where he was he was on the throne next to god and i just want to bring it up that you know many denominations and and myself in the past included i used to come to scripture and not understand some of these things and i would i would think that there was some portion of christ's kingdom that had not come and was not completed yet. Like there was, you know, a, a partial kingdom, and that someday maybe he would come back and set up a throne on earth, which was actually David's throne, and that we had that to look forward to. And, and Jews say this nowadays, too, that their Messiah is going to take a physical throne on earth, and that's why a lot of them are pushing for the third temple to be built in Jerusalem. The problem is... Peter tells us right here that the throne that David was talking about, David's throne, even David himself said that it's in heaven by at the right hand of my father. And so with this passage, we can you know debunk those claims. And we can know that when Christ came and God established him in the heavens at his right hand, his kingdom was complete. He's the king reigning. And now it's our job on earth to, as citizens of that kingdom and you know, but still living in the world, we are to, you know, as the, as the Lord's Prayer says, we are to uh, bring the kingdom to earth and establish it here uh, as your kingdom in heaven, right? And so we are here trying to tell this story and tell people that Christ's kingdom is real. It's not visible, but it's real. He is on the throne. He is the king, and you must acknowledge him as such or you're not a member of his kingdom. And that is the gospel message. And for me, it's so clear in this passage. I love this sermon of Peter's. I think that it should be shouted from the rooftops. I wish more pastors would preach on it. But I hope this is an encouraging, encouraging message for you on this Resurrection Easter Sunday. So thank you so much for joining me. God bless you and your family. Stay safe. And, um, you know, praise God in heaven that Jesus Christ is at his right hand right now and on the throne. And we are members of that kingdom if we truly believe in him and follow him and repent and do what's right. Um, we're a part of that kingdom and we need to show others that kingdom because faith is the evidence of the unseen. And so we know about that unseen place, that unseen kingdom. We've got to tell people about it so that, and that's faith. We're giving them the evidence of the unseen things of the Father. So let's do that throughout this resurrection holiday and as we live our lives in front of other people in the world. So God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me this Easter. And may God keep you and your family safe.